I mean, the first question that everyone asks me about this project is, why did he do it? And um, I asked him that directly. It's how the film opens, with me saying to him, why did you do it? And he says, there's not a simple one answer, which I think is the truth. So I think it's a really complicated story with a lot of nuance, and there's a lot of things that had to happen at the same time for this kind of massive fraud to happen at such an amazing institution like the New York Times. In the film, I interview uh, Howard Kurtz, who's the media critic for, at that time, the Washington Post. And he says very eloquently, which I think is right on the money, uh, I don't think there's a way, I don't think there's a news organization in the world that can protect against a committed liar. That the best fact-checking mechanisms um, are not designed to deal with people who come in to deceive on, on purpose. And the good news is that that's a very rare individual. And that's kind of the message of the film, that Jason Blair is extremely uncommon. He is not representative of all journalists out there. He is one person who happened to make some extremely bad decisions. And he should not be taken as a representative of all journalists. Because I think that that level of deception is very unique. Plagiarism is happening all the time. And part of it is because of the amount of content that's being created that we're hearing more about it. And part of it is because of the speed with which that content is being created. And some people, when they get busted for plagiarism, say, oh, I didn't realize um, I was copying and pasting or this and that. Um, and I think in some of those cases, that's actually true. In some of those cases, that's not true. It's just an excuse. Um, but if there were a way that a reporter could, let's say, before they send their story out to the world, go through a checklist and say, OK, did I do everything the way that I was supposed to do it? If there is any ethical gray area here, um, how can I be transparent about that or just incorporate that into the work that I did? So the idea of accidental plagiarism, that there's somebody out there who is just working so quickly, so fast, that they don't realize that they're copying, pasting, and publishing in their own work, the work of someone else. Um, some people do say that. Um, it's hard to know how much of the time that is actually true. But if there were a way we could establish either a set of best practices or the thing that we talked about was a tool like an app, a checklist that someone would have to go through before they actually publish their work. So it might slow down the process, meaning it might take an extra five, ten minutes before the story goes live. But ultimately, in the long run, it would save time in not having to do the corrections, not having to go through this, and it would save face because they would not have accidentally plagiarize something. When we're looking at this question, how might we encourage and reward intellectual honesty in reporting? Um, an example of that might be a, a rating system, or a tool, or a seal of approval, or a brand um, that you can kind of lay on top of the work of, let's say, an independent journalist who doesn't have the benefit of working inside a structured newsroom. Um, so it's just something that can allow some level of like verification that will allow their work to rise above. My hope with the film is to draw in a broad general audience into this conversation. I think the conversation about the importance of institutional media versus the democratization of the media is something that journalists can talk about day and night. We love to talk about that. We love to think about that. We love to think about ethics. We love to think about all of this stuff. But getting the general public to engage in a conversation about media, ethic, media ethics, media literacy, sorry, you want me to do that again? Sure. My little blub. Um, OK. You can go from getting. OK, right, because you've got two cameras. Um, so getting the general public to engage in a conversation about media ethics and media literacy is a taller order. Um, basically, if you say to somebody on the street, hey, do you want to watch this great film about media literacy? They're not going to come. But if you say to them, hey, do you want to come hear this story about the decline of this one young man who gets into the most powerful institution in journalism and then blows up his life, people are going to be interested in that. And my hope is that I can draw people in to the story. And before they know what's happening, they're thinking about things like media ethics, 
power, responsibility in the media, accuracy, and the fact that the film is entirely populated with brilliant journalists. The one exception is Jason Blair. So this is something I really care about. Um, I think getting some forward movement on some of these problems is critical. It's critical for the survival of journalism. And I am extremely interested in it. I literally sit around and in my dreams think about new tools that can exist, new things we can create, new networks, new browser extensions, new ways of viewing the media that can engage the public more. And I think ONA, this conference, is doing a good job of getting people to think about that. And that was what the second half of our session was, you know, getting people to think about these questions and then just sort of pie in the sky, dream up new tools that could be used to implement some of the things we'd like to see. A lot of people are feeling like this is doom and gloom, this is the end of journalism, this is such a terrible time. I think it's quite the opposite. I think it's a really exciting and energizing time to be in this field because there is so much possibility. And I do believe that we can restore some degree of public faith in the media. But I think there needs to be a sea change in how we think about the way we're doing our work.